We are The Point, a church that loves God, loves people, and loves life. If you're interested in learning more about us, please go to our website, thepointva.com. Thanks for listening. Go ahead and have your seat at both campuses. I want to welcome our Charlottesville campus, welcome our Louisa campus, as well as all of those who are joining us online. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm very excited. Uh, We have a very special treat this morning. I'm going to share a little bit with you about the man who is about to share God's word with us this morning. You see, this is no special guest. This is a a Point family member. This is a personal friend of mine, a mentor of mine, as well as many others in our Point family. Chris and his wife, Jana have served with the Navigators as missionaries for 18 years now, uh, and for the first 11 years, they spent uh, their time in Florida at the University of South Florida, uh, ministering on campus there, and then seven years ago, moved to Charlottesville uh, to launch a Navigators ministry on grounds at UVA and in the Charlottesville area um, to reach young adults and college students, and uh, since then, uh, God has been expanding uh, their ministry, and so today, Chris serves as the regional director with Navigators, where he oversees several campus ministries across four different states, and so Point family, I'm going to encourage you to join me, and let's give a very warm Point welcome. Welcome to Chris Gatlin. Thanks, buddy. Well, I'm excited to be with you guys this morning. Would you pray with me? And then we'll jump in. Lord, this morning, we've come here to hear from you. I pray you'd set aside all of the busyness and distractions in our lives and hearts that we might hear your voice clearly this morning. Lord, we commit this time to you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Several weeks ago, our family was really excited to attend our first UVA football game together. And right before the game started, my nine-year-old son looked at me and asked, is this tackle or two-hand touch football? (laughs) I immediately thought to myself, I have failed at life. And I have failed at my fatherly duties. My son is getting A's in school, but he doesn't know that college football is tackle football. Where did I go wrong? I suspect the parents around us were probably thinking, I bet their kids don't use silverware when they eat or even know how to tie their shoes. You know, in order to appreciate the football game, my son needed to know what the game was about. And in the same way as we begin this Christmas season, our hearts need to know what this season is all about if we're going to get the most out of it. So what is Christmas all about? It's about Jesus leaving the comfort and riches of heaven to become poor so that ultimately he could make us rich. Christmas is about King Jesus giving up his royalty by humbling himself to serve and to save broken people from their sins. Christmas is a reminder that when there was no way, God's love made a way for us. The message of Christmas is that there is hope for humanity. There is hope of forgiveness, hope of peace with God. Hope that someone could see us in all our brokenness and love us anyway. So this morning, we're going to explore the power and importance of hope. But as we do, it's important for us to differentiate between our culture's definition of hope and the Bible's. You see, when we use the word hope today, we mean something may or may not happen. So I might say, I hope it doesn't rain this weekend, and that may or may not happen. But when the Bible uses the word hope, it means something completely different. The Bible's definition of hope is an expectation for something in the future that will happen. Biblical hope means waiting on God to bring about a future that he promises will come. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Romans 15, verses 12 and 13. Here's what it says. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. In him, the Gentiles will hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning, we're going to look at four truths about hope. We're going to look at the need for hope, the source of hope, the path to hope, and the implications of hope. So let's begin with the first truth we learn from this passage, the need for hope. Notice that verse 13 says that God is a God of hope. He is a hope-filled and hope-giving being. And then it says that God actually wants us to overflow with hope. And the reason God wants us to overflow with hope is because he has made us to be hope-based creatures. Hope is not optional for us, it's a necessity. God hardwired us to live on hope. Humans can survive three weeks without food, three days without water, three minutes without oxygen, but we can't survive three seconds without hope. Hope is what fuels us to keep moving even when life is really hard. Hope is critically important for us because what we believe about the future determines how we live in the present. The story of Christmas is a story of hope. It gives us hope that God can redeem all that is broken in our lives. And it gives us hope that God can redeem all that is broken in our hearts. And it gives us hope that God can redeem all that is broken in our world. Hope is what enables us to face the inevitable suffering and uncertainties of life. And hope is what enables us to face one of life's most common struggles, disappointment. To face all the things that we hoped would be, but are not. You know, hope comes in a variety of shapes and sizes. Sometimes we hope for our circumstances to change. And by God's grace, Sometimes he does, in fact, change our circumstances. But sometimes God doesn't change our circumstances. And in those cases, we need a better hope. We need to hope that God would use our circumstances to change us, to transform our hearts. Sometimes we hope for strength to persevere one more day in a broken world. And sometimes hope gives us the strength we need to keep going and to find peace in the midst of of difficulty. I remember many years ago when Olivia arrived at UVA in search of hope. She had a very low view of herself and a faith that needed nurturing. You see, growing up, Olivia endured a lot of hardships, including an extraordinary amount of emotional abuse, which left her deeply, deeply wounded. In a moment of deep transparency, she shared that she hated herself and she thought that everyone's life would be better if she were dead. She had, in fact, lost the most important thing there is. She lost hope. In addition to getting Olivia immediate professional counseling, we also got her plugged into one of our Bible studies. And it was here that she began to experience the power of a loving community for the first time. The girls in her study rallied around her, they encouraged her, and they demonstrated God's love to her in tangible ways. One of Olivia's Bible study leaders began to meet with her and disciple her weekly. And she taught Olivia how to spend daily time with God. And they spent time in the scriptures together learning about God's love for her. And they began to memorize verses together. And Olivia's view of herself began to slowly change to conform to God's view of her. And she realized that she was fearfully and wonderfully made and that God actually wanted to use her to impact people's lives. A few years later, Olivia had a thriving relationship with God and she became one of our best and most popular Bible study leaders because she loved pouring her heart into the lives of girls and sharing what God had done in her life. You see, Olivia went from someone who had no hope to someone who was filled with the hope of Jesus. And over the last 18 years, I have had the privilege of seeing God take an uncountable number of students from a place of hopelessness and believing that life was not worth living to a place of hope. Because God is in the business of taking hopeless people and giving them hope. And God is in the business of taking hopeless situations and filling them 
with hope. You see, once we see our need for hope, we begin to wonder, where is it that we actually find hope? This leads us to the second truth that we learn from this passage, which is the source of hope. Look with me at Romans 15, 12. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up and one who will arise to rule over the nations, in him the Gentiles will hope. The term root of Jesse is used several times in the Bible as a metaphor for Jesus. And at the end of verse 12, it says that in Jesus, the Gentiles will put their hope. So this verse tells us the source of our hope is Jesus, that he is to be our greatest treasure. Jesus should be the most valuable and beautiful and priceless thing in our lives. Jesus should be the one who has captured the deepest affections of our heart. He is indeed the pearl of great price, the one who is worth sacrificing everything to acquire. And he is the only thing on this earth that is of infinite worth and value. When we talk about our hope, it's really another way of saying the thing that we look to for life, meaning, satisfaction, and fulfillment. Your hope is the thing that you are actually living for, the thing that everything else in your life revolves around. In this life, we need a hope that cannot be taken away from us. And there is only one hope that even in the face of suffering and death, can never be taken away from us. And that hope is Jesus. In Hebrews 6.19, it says that our hope in the person and work of Jesus is an anchor for our souls. This verse uses the analogy of our lives as a ship on the water. All ships have to face storms that are filled with rain and wind and waves that crash against the ship. But although the ship may be shaken and beaten and battered by the storm, the ship still stands firm because it has an anchor that cannot be moved because the anchor is stronger than the storm. And Hebrews 6.19 says that our hope in Jesus is the anchor for our very souls. No matter how difficult, uncertain, or confusing life gets. And this anchor has the power to keep us from drifting away from God and to keep us secure. You see, there's nothing more important in our lives than the object of our hope. So what is it that you are putting your hope in today? Is there a counterfeit hope that is hindering you from putting your hope in Jesus alone? It's so easy to put our hope in the approval of others, our reputation, our religious performance, our accomplishments, our career, our success, our financial security, the health of our marriage, or how our kids turn out. What is it that deep down you believe without that? If I don't have that, I'm nothing. Without that, life would hardly be worth living. Whatever that is, that is your hope. It was Tim Keller who said, if you add anything to Jesus as a requirement to be happy, that is your true king. You see, every false hope is an inferior joy to the everlasting joy found in Christ. And Jesus is inviting you today to abandon your false hope and to put your hope in him alone. Colossians 1.23 talks about us putting our hope in the gospel of Jesus. Now, why is that important? Because we put our hope in both the person of Jesus and the work of Jesus. And the work of Jesus is the gospel. The gospel is the truth and benefits of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, and what it has accomplished for us. Through the gospel... Jesus has set us free. Because Jesus has given you his approval, you and I no longer need the approval of others. Because Jesus was successful, you and I don't have to be. Because Jesus was strong for you, you are free 
to be weak. About 12 years ago, when we were living in Florida, two students from our campus ministry came over to our house to borrow some things. As we were grabbing some of those things, I noticed something in the back corner of my garage. I was immediately overcome by fear when I realized that something was a four-foot alligator that was sitting in my garage. After I saw him, I took a quick glance at the ground to see if I had peed myself. <laughs> and fortunately, I had not. One of the guys then says, I'm pretty sure it's dead since it's not moving. <laughs> said every guy who's ever been eaten by an alligator. I told him that it was not dead because alligators often sit still until dumb animals come close enough for him to eat them. And then he suggested that we throw a football at it to see if it was alive. And I said, that's a great idea. If you want to ensure the alligator eats you. Now I'm ashamed to admit that as the mature adult in this situation, I let this guy go through with his next idea. Now, I'm not saying that I buckled under pressure, but if someone were to buckle under pressure, it might look something similar to this. So he proceeds to grab my shovel. And he slides it up under the alligator's tail. And he tries to lift up his tail with the shovel. Now, when he did that, the alligator, who was dead, immediately slams his tail down, whips around, opens his mouth wide, and all three of us go, ah! And we took off running as fast as we could, screaming like little girls right out of my garage. Now, in case you're wondering, I found out that when my life is truly in jeopardy, I actually have cheetah-like reflexes that enable me to run out of the garage faster than some much younger college dudes. I was pretty happy about that. And once I got my heartbeat back down, we called Fish and Wildlife Services and we said, would you please come collect uh, an alligator from my home? And they were like, John will be there in 30 minutes. I was like, this is faster than I can get a pizza. Incredible. And when John pulls up to my house in his massive truck, I knew that hope had arrived. And then to my surprise, a very small man steps out of this very large truck. Now, in my mind, John was going to be 6, 7, and 300 pounds of muscle, as all alligator catchers are. But instead, he was smaller than me, and that's saying something. John looks at me and he says, Here, you boys got yourselves a gator. And I said, Yeah, about that. Uh, how many alligators have you caught before? I reckon a couple hundred. Did you just say hundreds? It was at this point that I realized John might be a small man, but he is a mighty man. And I was suddenly very filled with confidence when he said, do you guys want to come and watch me catch it? As a matter of fact, yes, we do. I was feeling very confident knowing that John was a fearless alligator catcher. And so we followed him into my garage where John then takes this long pole to put a noose around the alligator. And then he looks over at us and he says, watch this. And he pulls tight and all of a sudden the alligator goes crazy, starts doing death rolls in my garage, starts bumping into all kinds of things. Things are flying. It was like a scene from a movie. And it was like, what is happening? At this point, me and the other guys responded like any truly manly men would to this situation. We went, ah! and we went running out of my garage for the second time. John is laughing at us, and somehow he's able to both laugh at us and wrestle an alligator down at the same time. And he eventually ties up the gator's mouth and ties up his legs. And then he asked us if we wanted to hold the gator and take pictures with it. As a matter of fact, yes, we do. And so we held that alligator that just a few minutes earlier we were deathly afraid of. And what was the difference? When John showed up, we were filled with hope 
because we knew that he had the ability and the power to rescue us. In life, we will all encounter circumstances and challenges that we have never faced before. And we will have to decide in what or whom will I place my hope of deliverance? Will you put your hope in yourself or will you have the humility to acknowledge that you have a need and that you lack the power to handle this on your own? Will you have the wisdom to call for help and to place your hope in Jesus, who has handled this situation countless times before. And Jesus is patiently waiting for your call and invitation to drive up in his massive truck and to tell you that he can handle your situation. And sometimes Jesus will tie up your gaiters and let you hold them. And other times he will walk with you and carry you through situations that are incredibly difficult and painful. But Jesus always knows what to do, and he will never, ever leave you alone. And he is the only one who is worthy of putting your hope in. You see, understanding that Jesus is the source of our hope leads us to the next truth we learn from this passage, which is the path to hope. Look with me again at Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, as you trust in him. This verse tells us that the path to hope is trust. It's choosing to put your faith or trust in Jesus and his work for us. And if you trust in him, this verse actually says you get a three for one special. It says you get joy, peace, and hope. And that is a very good deal. Faith and trust can look like choosing to believe that what God has promised will eventually come to pass. It's choosing to believe that your current circumstances are not the final chapter and they will not have the final say in your life. It's choosing to trust that just because I can't understand why God is doing something doesn't mean there is not a good reason he is doing something. It's choosing to trust that just because I cannot see any good right now in this difficult circumstance does not mean that God cannot or will not one day bring about good from it. Christian hope is an expectation that in the midst of a broken world, God will still bring about good in this life and infinite good in the next life. Our hope is rooted in the fact that this world is not our home and that Jesus is coming back. Christian hope is different than other kinds of hope because Christian hope promises us a future with God that actually redeems and restores all that is broken in our lives and in our world. Christian hope promises us a future that doesn't just compensate you for your suffering, it completely undoes it. Christian hope says that one day everything that is sad will come untrue. Revelation 21.4 says that one day God will literally wipe every tear from your eyes and the joy of our lives with God will be supremely satisfying and fulfilling. Six months ago, I got a text from a very close friend that his 15-year-old son, who was close friends with my son, unexpectedly passed away. And they have experienced a tsunami of grief and sadness that has been gut-wrenching. But in the midst of their darkness and grieving, they have not grieved as those who have no hope. Sometimes their hope has been very, very dim, but it's still been there. And at the end of their son's memorial service, his parents chose a song for everyone to sing that declared the goodness and faithfulness of God. And during that song, I looked to the front row and I saw something that I will never forget. I saw his parents raising their hands in worship, declaring the goodness and faithfulness of God. They chose to worship and trust the God who just allowed their 15-year-old son to die. 
And during the worst six months of their lives, in the midst of their overwhelming grief and sadness and confusion, they have chosen to hold on to hope and trust. And seeing all of this has prompted me to ask myself a very difficult question. Do I have that kind of hope and trust? Do I have a hope in Jesus that would anchor my soul in the face of unspeakable tragedy and suffering? God, would you give me, would you give us that kind of hope and trust? The kind of hope that would anchor our souls even in the midst of life's darkest storms. Understanding the path of hope is foundational as we look to our final principle this morning, the implications of hope. Christmas reminds us that in the darkest night, the brightest star was shining forth. The light of hope always overcomes darkness. And one place where the light and hope of Jesus overcomes darkness is inside our own hearts. Is there anything more difficult than looking inside ourselves and being honest about what we see? That in spite of all the good things God has placed inside of us, there are also dark things hiding inside of us too. That's why we are so tempted to hide our sin, to blame others, to fake it, to downplay our imperfections, and to defend ourselves. It's hard to admit that deep down we are vulnerable, flawed, and afraid. It's hard to face our pride, our sin, our independence, our immaturity, our beliefs that we are smarter than God, that my way is better than his way, that my kingdom is more important than his kingdom, that pleasure, comfort, and ease are more important than eternal gain. And yet because of Jesus, we have the power and the hope to face ourselves and know that our sin no longer defines us. Jesus does. Our failures no longer define us. Jesus does. The gospel declares that we are no longer defined by our performance, but instead we are defined by the perfect performance of Jesus. The gospel declares that when I fail, instead of beating myself up, I can repent and celebrate the grace and forgiveness of God, which is forever mine. The light of Jesus penetrates the darkness inside our hearts, and it frees us from ever needing to hide again. Another place where the light and hope of Jesus overcomes the darkness is in our marriages. When we got married, I wasn't prepared for the way that our sins would harm one another. And I definitely wasn't prepared to figure out that I was actually exponentially more selfish than I thought I was. But Jesus brings light and hope to the dark places in our marriage. And multiple times in our 21 years of marriage, we have just felt a bit stuck in some patterns of unhealthy relating. Now, I'm sure you can't relate to any of that, but that's happened for us. And God showed us that he wanted us to be honest about that and to reach out to a Christian counselor to help us get unstuck. And God has used counseling to bring us hope and help and healing several times in our marriage. And I want you to know that if you're here today and your marriage is struggling, you are not abnormal, you are not alone, and Jesus longs to bring hope and healing to your marriage. Don't give up. Ask a Christian counselor for some help. It will be the best investment that you make in your marriage. This church has a number of counselors they will gladly connect you with. You see, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage because there's no such thing as perfect people. So what can you do this week to begin investing in and sowing hope into your marriage? Another place where the light and hope of Jesus overcomes the darkness is in our world. In a world and country that has become increasingly angry, divided, tribal, cynical, and judgmental, God has placed us to be beacons of hope. And he longs for us to be men and women of sacrificial love. 
And we are called to love people regardless of whether they look like us or think like us or agree with us or have different political views than us. He longs for us to bring his peace, his humility, his compassion to everyone that we meet. You see, the hope for our world and our city is us being the hands and feet and mouth of Jesus everywhere that we go. May the people of our church be known by our love, and may that love bring hope to many. As we conclude this morning, we're reminded that hope is not only a necessity of life, but it's something that our hearts deeply long for. And hope is what Christmas is all about. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into our world to give us hope that no matter what we face in life, Jesus can and will sustain us. And whatever you are facing today, I want to remind you that Jesus is with you, that he loves you, that he is in control, and that he will carry you through. As you think about your life, where do you need hope? today. Maybe you need hope in your marriage, in your singleness, in your job, in your family, in your health, in a relationship, or in a difficult situation that you're facing. Jesus longs for us to bring, Jesus longs to bring us hope and healing into the weary places of our hearts and lives where our hope has grown dim. He is inviting you into a deeper relationship with him, one in which you put your hope and trust in him alone. Would you turn your eyes to Jesus this morning as the one who not only gives hope, but the one who is hope? I'd like to close with a blessing from the book of Romans that may be familiar to you. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, thank you that Christmas is a message of hope in a world that seems to have lost hope. Thank you that you created us to be hope-filled creatures. And then you provided yourself to be the hope that we longed for. God, would you help us today to put our hope solely in Jesus and to abandon the counterfeit hopes that vie for our heart's affections. And God, would you bring hope into the places where we most need it in our lives. God, we are people who need your hope. Would you bring it to us, oh God? With every head still bowed, if you don't have a relationship with God today, but you want to begin one, I wanna lead you in a prayer and invite you to repeat this prayer after me silently in your own heart. God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for my sins. I give you control of my life. Please come into my life and forgive my sins. Thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen.